Here are the topics covered in the election process revision videos. This particular video will look at the general election campaign, looking explicitly at campaign finance and televised debates. We now come to the fifth stage in the process for the electing the president. Up until this point, the contest has been an intra-party contest, but during the general election campaign, it becomes an inter-party contest. General elections usually last around nine weeks, from the beginning of September to the first week of November. The campaign centres around two major issues, campaign finance and the role of television debates. Money cannot buy outcomes, but it helps a candidate make a strong bid for office. There are many examples of lower spending candidates winning. For example, Trump was heavily outspent by Hillary Clinton in 2016. Heidi Heitkamp for the North Dakota in 2016 is also an example of an incumbent legislator heavily outspending her challenger, yet she lost. Though it could be argued that Biden heavily outspent Trump in 2020 and won, this would be the opposite example. There is no doubt that US elections are big business and mightily expensive. There is also little doubt that the elections are full of legal complexities, ambiguities and loopholes. So where does this money go? The money is mainly spent on people and publicity. Professional campaigns need to employ a whole range of specialists, from political strategists to web designers. They also need office space and staff to fill them. These offices are set up across America. There is also the cost of advertisement, such as buying airtime to run political ads. By mid-October in 2020, the Biden and Trump teams combined spent $175 million on Facebook ads alone. Compare this with around $750 million spent on TV ads. Candidates also fly across the country during national campaigns to try and win over as many voters as possible. One of the biggest problems with elections in the US is that within their system, there is little to no regulation on political donations. This means that any donors, rich or small, can find ways to help their preferred party. The main source of income is self-funding and donations from individuals or PACs. Wealthy candidates may either wholly or partially fund themselves. Many billionaires have op adopted this approach. For example, Trump funded his campaign with an estimated $66 million of his own money into the 2016 campaign, though he only reportedly contributed just $8,000 of self-funding in the 2020 campaign. The advantage of self-funding is the freedom from influence or favours from donors, and therefore accusations of corruption. It is also free from any government restrictions other than disclosing funds to the Federal Election Commission, or the FEC. The disadvantages are that it encourages the perception that US politics is purely an activity for the wealthy. Donations can also come from supporters. Nearly all candidates for the national office accept donations from supporters. Money contributed directly to a specific candidate is known as hard money. This is limited by the Bipartisanship Campaign Reform Act, or BCRA. No individual can donate more than $2,800 per annum directly to a single candidate's own campaign, and no more than $35,000 to a national political party. However, there are ways around this. The National Action Committees, otherwise known as PACs, were created in the 1940s and are best described as candidate supporters groups. They can raise and distribute money to favoured candidates with a maximum donation of $5,000. Many established politicians also form leadership PACs as a way of raising money to help fund other candidates' campaigns. The second form of donations from supporters is money donated in the form of soft money. This is also known as independent expenditure and it is money spent indirectly to promote candidates or to attack opponents. The one criteria for this particular type of super PAC or other groups is that they raise and spend this money but cannot formally coordinate it with the candidate's own official campaign. As a result, all major candidates have large wealthy super PACs behind them, such as Future Forward USA, which backed Joe Biden in 2020, or the pro-Trump super PAC called Preserve America PAC. Finally, there is federal government funding. This is the least significant source of political funding, and there have been many attempts to introduce voluntary caps on campaign expenditure by trying to match federal funding for campaigns in return for candidates limiting their overall spending. The theory was that if candidates knew the state would match their own fundraising dollar for dollar to set up a limit, they would be far less consumed by constant fundraising. This did work for a time, but when Obama rejected it in 2008, calculating that he could raise more money by his own efforts than the limit set by accepting federal funding. Neither Biden or Trump accepted state funding for the 2020 election. 
Let's take a look at the 2016 election as a case study for how campaign finance worked in that election year. There were three super PACs that dominated the scene. Priorities USA Action raised over $192 million on behalf of Hillary Clinton's campaign. This represented over 90% of all outside group money raised on behalf of her campaign. Two super PACs raised money in support of Trump. Rebuilding America Now raised $22.6 million and Our Principles Pact raised $19 million. This is a much contested issue in US politics and the debate has been going on for many years. Essentially, it boils down to the topic of constitution versus corruption. Opponents of regulation argue that the First Amendment gives the right to freedom of political expression and therefore political donations are just another example of legitimate political activity. Supporters of greater regulation would argue that the current approach promotes political corruption of the worst sort. The old saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch, is never truer than when applied to political gifts. Those who give expect something back in return. Since not all are in the position to give due to the inequalities in wealth, such a system is rigged in favour of the already rich and powerful. Another important aspect of the general election is the televised debates. The first debates were held in 1960s, but it was another 16 years before the televised debates were held again. Televised presidential debates between the major party candidates have now become a traditional part of the campaign. Debates have varied in number and format since they were first used, but a pattern has now developed. There are three 90-minute debates between the two major parties' presidential candidates and one 90-minute debate between their vice presidential candidates, occurring usually between late September and mid-October. There are four rules of thumb that are worth thinking about during a presidential debate. The first is that style is often more important than substance. What you say is not as important as how you say it and how you look. In the first Gore versus Bush debate in 2000, Gore appeared overly made up. He interrupted Bush frequently, and when Bush answered, Gore audibly sighed and rolled his, rolled his eyes. Similarly, in the 2016 campaign, Trump was widely panned for his abrasive tone, which often bordered on being rude. Secondly, verbal gaffes can be costly. In 1976, President Ford mistakenly claimed that Poland was not under the control of the Soviet Union, and it was an expensive error. Perhaps the worst gaffe was in 2016, when Trump was towards the close of the third debate, when he repeatedly refused to say he would respect the result whether he won or lost. But unlike the gaffe made by Ford, Trump's apparent gaffe seemed not to worry his supporters. Indeed, they may have even enhanced his standing among them. Thirdly, there is the fact that good sound bites are helpful. Many voters do not watch the full debate, but they do see the sound bites that the television networks clip out for their breakfast shows the next morning. Lastly, debates are potentially more difficult for incumbents than for challengers. Incumbents have a record to defend and they have words spoken four years earlier that are thrown back at them. They also go into the debates as the perceived frontrunner. This was a big problem for Obama in 2012. There is a big debate surrounding televised debates as why many people no longer see them as important or making any difference to the campaign. True, they are the time when Americans will give the candidates their closest attention and they give the candidates one of their rare opportunities to talk unfiltered to the electorate. But there is only one example of debates having any significant effect on the final result, and this is Carter versus Reagan in 1980. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter and Governor Ronald Reagan met for their only head-to-head -head debate less than a week before Election Day. At the end of the debate, each candidate was given three minutes to make a closing statement. President Carter went first and made remarks that were well-meaning but eminently forgettable. Then Governor Reagan closed. In his closing statement, Reagan cleverly posed a series of questions to which he knew the majority of voters would answer in the negative. And with Election Day less than a week away, he managed to shape the way voters would make up their minds in these last vital days of the campaign. Support for President Carter fell away badly following the debate, and on Election Day he won only six states, plus the District of Columbia, for a total of 49 ele electoral college votes. How important are these debates? Well, it can be argued that they are very important as they are a long-standing tradition in US presidential races and are highly anticipated. They are seen as an opportunity for candidates to appear confident in their grasp of policy detail and to be effective responders under pressure and also to establish a level of perceived competence and charisma. They are the time when many Americans will give the candidates their closest attention and gives the candidates a rare opportunity to talk unfiltered to the electorate. 
On the other hand, debates can be seen as no longer important because they are not game-changing events. The vast majority of over 60 hours of presidential and vice presidential debates broadcast between 1960 and 2016 were lost from most memories soon after the conclusion of each debate.